where the past comes alive. Coming up, it took a fatal car crash to expose abuses in the nuclear power industry. Karen Silkwood claimed the nuclear plant where she worked was endangering workers and the public. Silkwood's union wanted proof. Somebody ought to stop her, and there are ways of stopping people. Her violent death remains a mystery. She was a sort of symbol, a Joan of Arc in a way. Karen Silkwood did not set out to become a martyr. She just wanted to make sure that her workplace was safe. But her mysterious death in 1974 would galvanize a growing public movement against nuclear power. Join us for Contaminated, the Karen Silkwood story. Karen Silkwood's life ended violently along a dark, lonely stretch of Oklahoma highway. Well, I think it's possible that someone set out to scare her. I believe that Karen's car was forced off the road. I think they would do whatever they had to do to pull her over to the side of the road, but they wanted the documents. Officially, Silkwood's death was ruled an accident. Authorities said the 28-year-old fell asleep at the wheel. But union organizers, critics of the nuclear power industry, and her father suspected foul play. Well, I know that she was run off the road and that somebody contaminated her. She didn't contaminate herself. In 1946, in the small town of Longview, Texas, about 120 miles east of Dallas, Karen Silkwood is born, the first of three girls. She had her own ideas of how to do things. And, uh, not that she was disobedient and nothing. She liked to do things her way. She grows up in Nederland, Texas, and in an era when most girls take home ec, Silkwood prefers science. Her best subject is chemistry. Though she gets straight A's, it makes her parents uncomfortable that Karen is taking these classes. She was in the science class with 32 boys. And she was the only girl, so I went up and complained about it. But they said as long as she kept her grade that she would stay in there. You know, she had no problem. Karen wins a scholarship to Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas to study medical technology, but she never graduates. Instead, she leaves school in 1965 after falling in love with Bill Meadows, a machinist she met the summer before college. They don't marry, but live together for seven years and eventually have three children. She loved her family took on part-time work, like a lot of women, in order to, to do wonderful things for her family. And then her family began to crumble. In 1972, Karen finds out that Bill is in love with another woman. She asks him to end the affair, but he refuses. Instead, Bill offers her a divorce from their common-law marriage on one condition. She must give him custody of the children. She refuses. Then, one morning, Bill wakes up to find Karen gone. Silkwood is now on her own. She lands a job with one of the nation's largest energy conglomerates, the Kerr-McGee Corporation, at its Cimarron River nuclear facility in Crescent, Oklahoma. There, Silkwood works with radioactive plutonium, she is aware that the substance is used in nuclear bombs. But her new job involves preparing it to generate electricity. The Kerr-McGee Corporation has a multi-million dollar contract to produce fuel rods for a reactor in Hanford, Washington. At Cimarron, plutonium powder is formed into pellets and loaded into the fuel rods, which are then welded shut. With very little training, Silkwood is assigned a crucial job, quality control in the plant's metallography lab. Among her responsibilities is to check rod welds for plutonium leaks. She is excited about this career in science. 
something she's dreamed of since high school. Workers at the Cimarron plant are supposed to receive 24 hours of instruction in handling plutonium, but often begin the job with little or none. When Silkwood is trained, her managers tell her that a speck of plutonium dust on her skin is enough to contaminate her, but that surface contamination can simply be washed off. Internal contamination is worse. If plutonium gets in the air, alarms will sound and she must put on a mask to avoid inhaling it. But Kerr McGee leaves the most frightening information out. It was not made clear to the workers at Kerr McGee that plutonium would cause cancer. Uh, that uh, very tiny amounts inside your body could prove harmful years later. There are very strict procedures that you had to follow and that uh, you had to have a, a rigorous amount of training. Members of the local oil, chemical, and atomic workers union sense that Kerr McGee is not as concerned with their employees as they are with their profits. Often, workers are pushed to meet deadlines regardless of what is safe. In November 1972, the union goes on strike, seeking better wages and working conditions. Silkwood's boyfriend and co-worker, Drew Stevens, persuades her to join the pickets. But after two months, the union loses, and it's quickly back to business as usual at Kerr McGee. By the spring of 1974, 28-year-old Karen Silkwood has worked at the Kerr McGee nuclear plant in Oklahoma for just over a year. She is becoming increasingly disturbed by what she hears alarms going off all too often, signaling that radioactive plutonium dust is in the air. People were being regularly contaminated to such an extent that they were inhaling plutonium particles. They were inhaling radioactive material into their lungs. Silkwood wonders how safe she is. She tells her boss that her air mask is too big to make a tight seal against her face. Silkwood has a reputation for complaining, and Kerr McGee has a habit of ignoring her. Tension mounts, but Silkwood blows it off by racing her Honda Civic in autocross competitions and smoking marijuana with her boyfriend and co-worker, Drew Stevens. Now that she left her family and is on her own as an adult in her 20s, free for the first time in her life, she becomes a different person. But what she carried from her previous life were the very things that drove her to become a whistleblower. In late spring, Kerr McGee steps up production. This means 12-hour shifts seven days a week. The pressure is taking its toll on Karen. She was incredibly tense, worried, had terrible problems sleeping. So she went to a doctor saying that she couldn't sleep, and he prescribed uh, quaaludes, which at that time were not thought to be addictive. They calm her for a while, but anxieties are running high at the plant. On the long shifts, she hears the alarms even more frequently as exhausted workers get careless and accidents happen. When she decided that it's time to do something, then there was only one place to go, and that was the Union. In August 1974, Silkwood is elected to a position on the Union Contract Bargaining Committee. Her assignment is health and safety. Now Kerr McGee is forced to pay attention to her. I said, if you something you want to do, go ahead. But uh, she uh, volunteered for too much, uh, I think, there to bit. Uh, she didn't know what she was getting into. Silkwood starts asking questions, and using this notebook, she begins to compile her co-workers' complaints to give to the union. In a hard-pressed community where any steady job is a good job, this agitation brands Silkwood a troublemaker. This is Oklahoma, you know, and uh, uh, you know, as I say, bright, vivacious woman, uh, rebellious. And, you know, it's a natural situation. There are people who don't like you. Silkwood takes her union assignment seriously. 
In September 1974, she boards a plane for her first trip to Washington, D.C. She and two other union members want help from the National Office of the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. The three present a list of their complaints to union officials Tony Mazzocchi and Steve Wadka. We had Karen and her co-workers explain that people in the plant were being contaminated with plutonium, that the amount of training was inadequate, that the knowledge of the workers about the hazards to the plant was very low, that management didn't care. Wadka and Mazaki agree to bring their concerns to the National Office of the Atomic Energy Commission. But the trip proves valuable for another reason. Silkwood and her friends learn Kerr McGee has been keeping crucial information from its employees. That even tiny dosages of plutonium lodged inside the body can be life-threatening. That over time, it can cause cancer. They didn't understand that any contamination from plutonium could cause cancer in the future. It was disbelief. You're telling me that all along I've been exposed to this risk? Silkwood is furious. She had been contaminated just a month before. She then brings up yet another concern, one that's not on the list. So it was at that meeting that Karen revealed to me after many hours and it was just almost an aside, the fact that uh, she was aware that quality control data concerning the fuel elements was being tampered with. Silkwood explains how she examines x-rays of the welds in assembled fuel rods. On several occasions, she has noticed that quality control reports noting fuel rod defects have been changed and the rods have been shipped. The union officials are stunned. In a worst case scenario, defective fuel rods could cause a meltdown or nuclear explosion. They couldn't sit on this information. I mean, the implications uh, could have been very severe. I mean, design imperfections, something could have happened, a major accident. Mazagi has a plan. If Silkwood's allegations can be proven, the story can be leaked to a union contact at a major newspaper. So Silkwood volunteers to get the quality control reports and the x-rays to back up her charges. But since these documents belong to Kerr McGee, the only way to get them will be to steal them. Karen is willing to take the risk. Silkwood returns to Oklahoma with a new focus. She is now passionately concerned with the health and safety of her fellow workers. Two weeks later, she is in the audience when the union calls a special meeting at the American Legion Hall in Crescent. The union brings in scientists to explain the dangers of plutonium to the Kerr-McGee employees. The scientists pound away at one theme, plutonium causes cancer. The workers are shocked. Silkwood stands up and speaks out. There is something going on, and if we are going to be susceptible to cancer, we're not going to know that in 20 years. By the fall of 1974, Karen Silkwood has spent two months gathering information about the nuclear plant where she works. She has been interviewing workers, noting contamination incidents, and collecting documents. If she thinks she's been doing this in secret, she's wrong. It was no secret. It was obvious to everyone. It was obvious to the workers and to the managers what she was doing. And I think she was, she was kind of cocky. She keeps in touch with her union contact in Washington, Steve Wadka, often calling from pay phones as a precaution. During one late night call, Wadka, too tired to take notes, tapes the conversation instead. Uh, in the laboratory, we've got 18 and 19 year old boys, you know, and 20 and 21. I mean, and they don't, they didn't have the schooling, so they don't understand what radiation is. They don't, they don't understand, Steve. 
She insists that despite what she thinks are obvious flaws in the fuel rods, they are being shipped out for use in a nuclear reactor. And I've got on here that we're still passing all wells, no matter what the pictures look like, no matter what the wells look like. We either grind down too far. And I've got a well I'd love for you to see now. Just how far they ground it down until we lost the well, trying to get rid of the voids and the inclusions and the cracks. And I kept it. But Silkwood and her union contacts have a plan. She will leak her evidence of quality control tampering to New York Times reporter David Burnham. You see, the big story really is had the Atomic Energy Commission uh, failed to properly regulate this. I mean, that was what I was interested in. You know, this industry was very soft and had been puffed up way out of perspective. So I was looking for chinks in the armor and she offered a possible chink. Silkwood's assignment is nerve-wracking. She begins taking her insomnia medication, Quaaludes, during the day to keep calm. She phones her parents and tells them to send her job applications from companies back in Texas. She was uh, going to give them a two-week notice and come home. She wasn't going to stay with Kermit again. But before Silkwood's mission is complete, she falls victim to what has become her greatest fear, contamination. On November 5th, 1974, at the end of her shift, she waves her hands in front of the monitor that checks for plutonium exposure. Silkwood's surface contamination readings are 40 times over the safety limit. The gloves themselves had plutonium inside, or there was a hole in the glove and the radiation got through, or somebody put some plutonium in there. And when she put her hands in, she got contaminated. The radiation levels on her skin are so high, she has to go through a grueling shower, washing her skin with chlorine bleach and laundry detergent. Afterward, Silkwood is told that she'll have to bring urine and fecal samples to the plant for the next five days to check the level of her internal contamination. The next day, Silkwood drops off her samples and after about an hour's work, heads for a union contract negotiating session. On her way, she checks her exposure levels. They're very high, and the plutonium has become too embedded in her skin to be removed even with bleach and detergent. Karen will have to endure her first so-called scrub-down, something every nuclear worker dreads. It wasn't just taking a bar of soap and washing it off, because the particles would be embedded in the skin, and you had to get that layer of skin off in order to get rid of the uh, contamination. So you had to essentially rub yourself raw in order to get the uh, contamination off your skin. The following morning, November 7th, she returns to the Cimarron plant. The health supervisor checks her internal and external radiation levels, and the news is bad. Her contamination is higher than ever. Because she hasn't been working with plutonium since she left the day before, there is only one ominous explanation. She's now been exposed to plutonium outside the plant. Nearly hysterical, Silkwood is put through another agonizing scrub down. Co-worker Jim Smith sees Karen in the plant before he goes to her home to inspect for contamination. All I recall was her standing in the hall and they were surveying her out. She was contaminated. They in turn sent people to her apartment. Silkwood watches in tears as her home is inspected. Mysteriously, the hottest spots are the bathroom floor, the toilet seat, and inside the refrigerator. But the entire apartment is also contaminated. She stands by helplessly as men in protective gear remove her possessions by the armful. I got down there, they were still loading stuff in barrels. I think they ended up taking between 15 and 20 55 gallon barrels out of there. Which was everything from the food to the clothing to the normal stuff that you'd have in an apartment. Everything went, the refrigerator, 
the couch, coffee tables, the television set. Just cleaned it out. Left nothing. She was down there, standing out front bawling, and then she disappeared. I don't know where she went. For the first time, Karen is truly terrified. She goes to a payphone and calls Steve Wadga, but she's crying so hard he can barely understand her. She tells him she thinks that someone has deliberately tried to contaminate her by planting plutonium in her home. She phones her parents and tells them she's been contaminated and that it's going to kill her. She wants to come home. She also calls her boyfriend, Drew Stevens. She said, just stay there and she'd be down. And she showed up down here and she was shaking like a leaf. And she was hysterical. She was incoherent and she kept saying over and over again that I'm going to die. The bizarre pattern of radiation inside the house raises the question, was Karen Silkwood deliberately contaminated? If so, why? One reason would be to scare her so she quit. Another reason would be to contaminate her so badly that they could fire her. A third reason would be if they knew she had documents, wouldn't this give them an excuse to go in and look for them? A Kerr-McGee official does make this list of everything taken from the apartment, but no documents are noted. Back in D.C., Union leaders Mazaki and Wadka are worried that Silkwood's cover may be blown. So they decide it's time to leak the information she's been collecting. They schedule the meeting with reporter David Burnham for November 13th, less than a week away. But Silkwood's first concern is her health. She meets with Atomic Energy Commission investigators and physicians. They insist that she go to the Federal Center for Nuclear Research in Los Alamos, New Mexico for more sophisticated testing. At Los Alamos, Silkwood is told that she has plutonium in her lungs. The doctor tries to reassure her, saying that he believes her contamination level is within a safe range. But he admits that his tests can't tell her if she's fatally contaminated or not. Silkwood is shaken and certain now that she'll die from cancer. Uh, she came back to Oklahoma and we asked her if she still wanted to proceed with uh, the collection of all the quality control information. She said yes. In less than 24 hours, she'll turn over the damaging information about Kerr McGee. It's November 13th, and Silkwood is to meet the New York Times reporter at 8 p.m. At 5.30 p.m., she attends a union meeting at the Hub Cafe in Crescent, where she sits near her friend and co-worker, Wanda Jean Young. Karen did tell me that she hadn't was exposed enough that, you know, she would die, you know, from radiation, cancer, or, you know, any way it could affect you many, many ways. But she told me that she would not live. Karen tells Wanda Jean that there's one thing she's happy about. She's about to blow the whistle on Kerr McGee. Karen had all this stuff that she was going to take to Oklahoma City to the Holiday Inn. She had all of it and she kept flipping through the papers, you know. And she had a big manila folder. I'd say a good, it was bigger than an 10. And it was just about that thick. Around 7 o'clock, Silkwood leaves the meeting and begins the 30-mile drive to meet with the Times reporter in Oklahoma City. A half hour later, the wreckage of Silkwood's car is found by a truck driver less than 10 miles from Crescent. Two Kerr-McGee managers who happened to be driving by arrive shortly after the trucker, but before the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. One of them looks into the car. He sees Silkwood 
slumped over her steering wheel, dead. On her way to expose health and safety violations at a nuclear fuel plant, 28-year-old Karen Silkwood has a fatal car accident along an Oklahoma highway. In her purse, police find two marijuana joints and one quaalude, a sedative Silkwood was taking. Waiting for her at a hotel in Oklahoma City are her boyfriend, Drew Stevens, her contact from the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, Steve Wadka, and New York Times reporter David Burnham. It is nearly 10 o'clock when they learn that she is dead. I was sitting there with Drew, her boyfriend. I had to turn around and I had to tell Drew that his girlfriend has been killed. Stunned, the three of them immediately leave in search of the stretch of highway where Silkwood's car went off the road. It was a cold night and the wind was blowing and you know, I remember parking and the headlights the police had cleaned it up pretty well, but we actually found a, a paperback novel she had been reading. And I remember we got in the car and we had the, you know, the dome light, the car light on, and it was splattered with her blood. And that was pretty sobering. Meanwhile, at the garage where Karen's Honda had been towed, the police aren't the only ones to search the vehicle. Not only did AEC officials go through everything that was in the car, but also Kerr McGee people as well have been able to go through all of her personal effects. Whether the AEC and Kerr McGee officials removed anything is unknown. Wadka, Burnham, and Stevens don't get in to see the car until the next morning. When they do, all that's left are a few personal items. No company documents of any kind. No manila folder that her friend Wanda Jean Young claimed she saw. The folder that Karen Silkwood said she was bringing to the New York Times reporter. However, the first highway patrol officer at the accident scene, Rick Fagan, did report seeing documents with Kerr McGee letterhead scattered on the ground. He says he picked them up and put them in the car before it was towed away. If true, then someone took them out of the car at the garage. We were more in shock over her death than anything else, but when we were told that, on top of the fact that the documents weren't in the car, that's when we felt that something wrong was going on. Without waiting for an autopsy, Officer Fagan files his report. In it, he concludes that Silkwood was asleep at the wheel and under the influence of drugs. The union disputes this account and hires its own accident reconstruction specialist, A.O. Pipkin. He studies the accident site and Silkwood's Honda Civic. Pipkin finds traces of rubber in a dent on the rear bumper of the Civic traces that are confirmed by an independent lab. In my opinion, and the people that I've had working with me, there's enough circumstantial evidence there to indicate that somebody may, hit, another vehicle may have hit the car in the rear. The question that remains is whether the dents were made the night Silkwood died. Her boyfriend, Drew Stevens, tells investigators he's never noticed them before. But Silkwood's autopsy results are released soon after Pipkin's report, and the lab analysis indicates a high level of quaaludes in her system. The medical examiner concurs with the highway patrol and rules her death an accident. Four days after the crash, Silkwood's family buries her in Texas. Because all of her possessions, including her wardrobe, have been seized by the Kerr-McGee decontamination team, her family must buy Karen a new dress for her funeral. But her family and supporters do not believe the official explanation of how she died. Bill Taylor, a private investigator hired by the Silkwood estate, spends months analyzing documents and the crash scene and comes to a startling conclusion. At this point here, Karen was slightly looking over her right shoulder, watching the car. 
that was paralleling her and blocking her from being able to pull back up onto the highway went off this edge of the culvert embutment, striking the other side of which, in my opinion, she was killed instantly. Still, police consider the case closed, an obvious example of driving under the influence. Yet in an interview months after the accident, the Highway Patrol's lead investigator remains uninformed about crucial aspects of the case. Well, it appears that uh, Ms. Silkwood braced her arms as the uh, impact occurred. Is that consistent with someone who is uh, practically unconscious from drugs? Well, uh, probably not. In other words, you're normally in a very relaxed state being under a depression type drug. I was unaware of the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, where do you have the information or how do you presume that she braced just prior to impact? Only because of the way the steering wheel was bent. Then. Have you seen the car? Right. Uh, all right. Is the, have you seen the car? No, I haven't. Is the alignment uh, uh, of the wheel indicating that she bent it with her hands or bent it with her my, chest my, and stomach? My, my guess from looking at the wheel would be that it was pressed forward on both sides. Okay. That would indicate that probably she had a hold of the wheel, which that, is interesting. And that would not be consistent with someone who was unconscious uh, because of the use of drugs. No, probably not. Union and other investigators are convinced that Silkwood was run off the road by someone hoping to retrieve the papers she was delivering to the Times reporter. I don't believe whoever was chasing her intended to kill her. I think they would do whatever they had to do to pull her over to the side of the road, but they wanted the documents. The union takes its concerns to the FBI. Agents do a cursory investigation and conclude that Silkwood's death, quote, does not appear to be murder, unquote. Again, case closed. Yet Karen Silkwood's story is far from over. In early 1975, within three months of Silkwood's death, the Atomic Energy Commission releases three reports on safety and security at Kerr-McGee. One of the reports backs up many of the charges made by Silkwood and the Union, such as the poor working conditions and lack of safety measures at the Cimarron plant. The other two reports conclude that Kerr-McGee did violate some quality control procedures and that Silkwood was contaminated outside of company property. In addition, her urine samples had somehow been spiked. They contained insoluble plutonium, which would have been impossible for her to pass in her urine. And the AEC determines that the plutonium found in Silkwood's home came from restricted areas of the Cimarron plant. As a low-level employee, Silkwood did not have access to those areas. In the wake of the investigations, a national spotlight is brought to the case by newspapers, magazines, and television. Good evening. For much of the next half hour, I'd like to look with you at a real-life whodunit. Call it the case of the worried woman in the plutonium plant. She was driving to a rendezvous one night to deliver a report attacking her bosses. She died in a car crash. The mystery, what caused the crash? Political activists also joined the crusade to find out what really happened to Karen Silkwood. I felt very strongly that if, if women didn't step forward to demand an investigation, there wouldn't be one. Here was a young woman who was bringing a warning about a danger in the community who was uh, killed under mysterious circumstances. Should we just turn our backs? In 1976, two years after her death in a car crash, Karen Silkwood's family files a lawsuit on behalf of her estate. The suit charges her employer, Kerr McGee, with willful negligence in allowing her to be contaminated by plutonium. The case finally comes to trial in 1979. Dean McGee regarded the case and the trial as an outrageous intrusion and 
uh, slur on his company. As far as he was concerned, Karen Silkwood was a slut who had brought all this on herself and had probably staged everything to embarrass his company. Kerr McGee publicly characterizes Silkwood as a promiscuous drug abuser who contaminated herself in order to discredit the company. They were vilifying her. They were criticizing her and, and making personal attacks on Karen. To counter that view, the Silkwood team feels they need a lawyer with a common touch. They hire folksy Wyoming attorney Jerry Spence to present their case to the jury. Tell the truth, man. Tell the truth. To whom? To the whole world. To the, all of the nuclear industry, to the AEC, to everybody. He went on and put that evidence on and showed what, how, how uh, unhealthy the entire plant was and how reckless, uh, how reckless the disregard was of this plant for the safety of the people in the whole vicinity. Spence immediately calls on health physics experts who stun the jury with their testimony about the links between plutonium and cancer. For example, plutonium is the most lethal substance known to man. It does not exist in nature, it is man-made. Once it's in you, it doesn't go away. You don't get rid of it. And if you're exposed to it, it is a death sentence. But worse is that it would set in motion a chain of events that would kill you in five or 10 or 15 years, just as sure as if they put a gun in your head. One of the experts who testified at trial said that the training that was used by Kerr McGee was kind of like inviting Daniel into the lion's den without telling him that the lions were there. This is all fresh in the jury's minds when during the third week of the trial, America's first large-scale nuclear crisis occurs. Newspapers and television are blanketed with stories of the near meltdown at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Is there a potential of a hydrogen explosion? I think that potential exists, but I think it's exceptionally minimal. Back inside the courtroom, Silkwood's allegations about shipping defective fuel rods are bolstered. There is evidence that a lab worker falsified quality control x-rays with a felt-tip pen. But the worker insists he was only trying to hide dust spots on the negative, not any flaws in the welds. From Karen's view, you couldn't tell looking at them. And as a result, from the from her perspective, they were doctoring them. Finally, there is the issue of security. On one hand, Kerr McGee argues that Silkwood stole plutonium from work to prove security was lax. On the other, they claim that though Silkwood was able to steal plutonium, there was no security problem. But in the course of the trial, Kerr McGee must concede that over 40 pounds of weapons-grade plutonium is missing and unaccounted for at the Cimarron plant, enough to make three nuclear bombs. That was another element that the jury, I mean, it's, I'm sure, you know, the hair on the back of their neck stood up when they had to acknowledge that it's somewhere. But exactly where it is, well, we don't really know. And if you don't know where it all is, then it raises questions about whether this material has gone somewhere else, possibly for purposes like making nuclear weapons, or it could have escaped into the environment and created a potentially very serious uh, uh, a public health danger. In his closing argument, attorney Jerry Spence maintains that Kerr McGee is responsible because the plutonium that contaminated Silkwood was theirs, regardless of how she was exposed. If the lion gets away, he says, Kerr McGee must pay. The jury agrees and awards her estate ten and a half million dollars. Karen has been vindicated, and what she was saying was true, and I think the American public believes her now. Although Silkwood's father was pleased with the verdict, he still wants to know how his daughter died on that lonely stretch of Oklahoma Highway. And I've still got a $10,000 reward for anybody that has information that will lead to the person or persons that did it. He never did get a satisfactory answer as to her death, but it did vindicate her in the sense that it showed that she was right in her
concerned about how Kermagee was um, running the plant. The religion of America is science and technology. And I think that is part of the reason the Silkwood story was such a big deal. She was a sort of symbol going up against a really embedded faith system. And it turns out that uh, Karen Silkwood was right. Kerr McGee did appeal the verdict, but eventually settled out of court for $1.38 million. Even now, no one from the company or its legal team would agree to an interview. The plant where Karen Silkwood worked was shut down in 1975. Though it focused public attention on working conditions and security in nuclear plants, the Silkwood case brought about no new regulations for the nuclear power industry. To discover more about this and other History's Mysteries topics, please visit our website at historychannel.com.